Hey guys, today I'll show you a horror TV series named Junji Ito Maniac, Japanese Tales of the Macabre. Spoilers ahead, watch out and take care. The first story, titled Tomb Town, begins during a summer vacation, when Tsuyoshi drove with his sister to visit the town of their friend Izumi. After driving for a long time, they still hadn't reached their destination. He thought his sister's navigation was wrong and snatched the map to check. As he was distracted, a girl suddenly appeared in the middle of the road. He slammed the brakes but still hit her. In a panic, the siblings carried the girl into the car, planning to take her to the hospital. However, they found she had no pulse and was already dead. To avoid punishment, they hid her body in the trunk, intending to secretly bury her in the mountains after passing through the town. But soon they discovered a tombstone standing in the middle of the road. They had never seen a tombstone in such a place. As they tried to drive around it, more tombstones appeared, blocking their way. Tsuyoshi tried to turn around and take another route, but the car's rear quickly hit a tombstone, rendering it immobile. The townspeople gathered around, offering to help by using a jack to lift the car. They discussed how encountering such an event might bring bad luck, and hoped that the siblings wouldn't be cursed. Tsuyoshi quickly opened the trunk to get the jack, relieved that the body wasn't discovered. The townspeople helped fix the car, and the siblings finally met Izumi. It turned out that in this town, tombstones appeared wherever someone died. In Izumi's home, there was even a tombstone belonging to the previous owner. With some time before dinner, Izumi decided to show the siblings around the town. Tombstones were everywhere. Perhaps to save indoor space, the townspeople tried to have their deceased die outdoors. At the hospital, an old man was about to pass away, and the doctor rushed to carry him outside to a vacant spot, waiting for his death. On the road, they discovered a cat killed by a car. Tsuyoshi wanted to bury it, but Izumi told him not to touch it, saying that if he did, the cat couldn't attain Buddhahood. Just then, Izumi's family realized that Izumi's younger sister had been missing since she went hiking in the morning. They thought she was just playing somewhere, but she still hadn't returned by evening. Worried, Izumi's family went out to search for her. The siblings finally realized that Izumi's missing sister was the girl they had hit and hidden in the trunk. Tsuyoshi told his sister to act natural and not give themselves away. The next day, the entire town mobilized to search for the missing girl. The siblings pretended to be clueless and joined the search in the mountains. However, they couldn't find her anywhere. Everyone suspected that the girl had fallen into an ancient well at the shrine, a bottomless pit used for disposing of bodies that couldn't attain Buddhahood. The sister grew increasingly anxious, but her brother Tsuyoshi still warned her not to reveal the truth. They saw the old man who had died the day before, now transformed into a stone pillar and expected it to become a tombstone by the next day. It turned out that the tombstones formed naturally after death, not built by people. As the siblings walked back, they saw Izumi looking at their car. Tsuyoshi nervously asked her what was wrong. Izumi mentioned that people found tire marks from emergency braking on the mountain road, as well as bloodstains and paint nearby. She left after making an excuse. The siblings then noticed blood on the back seat of the car, thinking that Izumi must have seen it. That's why she was avoiding them with a tense expression. Izumi mentioned that if corpses were moved after death, they couldn't become tombstones and attain Buddhahood. She had seen a failed transformation, with the body ultimately thrown into the ancient well at the shrine. Unable to bear it any longer, the sister wanted to confess, but Tsuyoshi interrupted her and bid Izumi farewell late that night. Under the watchful eyes of Izumi's family, the siblings left the eerie town. Tsuyoshi had an idea. He drove to the shrine, intending to dispose of the girl's body in the well and destroy all evidence. The car felt heavier, requiring more force to move. When they opened the trunk, they found the girl's body had transformed. With great effort, they carried it to the well and threw it in. Afterward, Tsuyoshi discovered a scratch on his hand. Then, the girl's body crawled out of the well, her stone pillar-like body growing several times larger and reaching for the sky. She screamed to Izumi that her death was Tsuyoshi's fault. Panicking, he tried to silence her, only to realize it was just a dream. In panic, the siblings drove home immediately. After returning from the small town, Tsuyoshi's sister was immersed in guilt every day and chose to confess her crime to the police, while Tsuyoshi, who got his hand injured during disposing of the corpse, was desperate to see something like crystals growing out of his injured hand, gradually corroding his whole body and claiming his life in the end. On the other side, Izumi found her sister's bell bracelet by the well. Knowing that his daughter died in the well and couldn't attain Buddhahood, the father fell sick and collapsed. In the end, all three of the family drank pesticide to end their own lives and turned into three tombstones inside the house. 
The second story, titled The Strange Hikazuri Siblings, The Seance, begins with a shot of the six Hikazuri siblings whose parents had passed away. One day, the eldest brother, Kazuya, had to leave for work again. Each time, his younger siblings would see him off at the door. They were grateful for his hard work in supporting the family, but in reality, the inheritance left by their parents was enough to provide for the six siblings without any worries. Kazuya didn't actually need to work, so he would just leave the house pretending to work and spend the day leisurely at some random place. That's when he noticed a beautiful girl named Sachio taking photos by a nearby pond. She said that children often drowned in this pond, and she was taking pictures of the supernatural. Intrigued, Kazuya claimed to be interested in the paranormal as well, and invited Sachio to visit his family's eerie old mansion. Sachio followed him to his home, where the atmosphere was dark and gloomy, seemingly haunted by spirits. Kazuya then took Sachio to his parents' graves, where his brother Chubby approached and tried to flirt with her. This annoyed Kazuya greatly. At dinner, the youngest sister suddenly started crying, missing her mother. The siblings pushed each other to comfort her, with the timid brother ultimately chosen for the task. However, without babysitting skills, he only made the situation worse, and ended up crying after being hit by his sister. Another sister also got angry at Chubby for his thoughtless flirtatious words with the guest and lashed out at him. Kazuya joined in the attack, leaving Chubby upset and storming off. Suddenly, Kazuya suggested holding a seance to summon their parents' spirits, hoping it would calm his siblings. He asked the sister to invite Sachio as a witness, which was his main goal. Sachio, on the other hand, discovered something terrifying in the photos she developed. At that moment, she received the invitation to the seance. Unexpectedly, her boyfriend also joined her. Although Kazuya was not willing to have him around, he couldn't refuse, so he let him in. The seance began, and Chubby started reacting, vomiting a disgusting substance, supposedly the materialized spirit matter. Afterward, their father's spirit supposedly possessed Chubby, scolding Kazuya for not taking proper care of his siblings and pretending to go to work every day. He stripped Kazuya of his eldest son status and made Chubby the head of the family. Chubby returned to normal after the spirit left, and Sachio's boyfriend took a sample of the spirit matter to study in his lab. Angry, Kazuya smashed his father's tombstone with a rock, feeling some relief. In the following days, Chubby, as the family's new leader, bossed his siblings around, becoming an emperor-like figure in the household. He announced another seance and asked Kazuya to invite Sachio, but not her boyfriend. Meanwhile, the boyfriend discovered that the supposed spirit matter was actually udon flour, vomited by Chubby from overeating. Sachio felt tricked and refused Kazuya's invitation. Realizing the truth, Kazuya accused Chubby of faking their father's possession to gain power. They fought, and during their brawl, the timid brother vomited the actual spirit matter which took the form of their father. The six siblings fled for their shitty lives in fear, chased by the spirit, which eventually returned to their father's tombstone. It seemed that when Kazuya had knocked down the tombstone, their father's spirit had emerged and entered the timid brother, who was, in fact, the one with supernatural abilities. The third story, titled Ice Cream Truck, begins with an ice cream truck visiting the neighborhood, selling delicious ice cream every Saturday. The children could take their newly purchased treats, hop into the truck, and enjoy a ride around town as they ate. This was a free added service offered by the truck. Tomoki from a single parent family also wanted to taste the ice cream. However, his father had already prepared dinner, so he didn't agree. As a result, Tomoki threw a tantrum when they got home, rolling around on the floor. Another Saturday came and the ice cream truck returned. To make his son happy, the father decided to buy Tomoki an ice cream and let him ride around town in the truck. Excited, Tomoki got on board. When he came home that evening, he told his father about a mountain of strawberry ice cream inside the truck, which all the children fought to lick. Tomoki licked so much that his tongue turned red and he didn't want to eat dinner. One day when the father came home from work, he found that Tomoki had made a bunch of new friends on the truck who were now visiting their home. Happy that his son had made friends, the father didn't think much of it. When Saturday arrived again, the father wanted to join the children on the truck. However, the owner said adults were not allowed on board. Before leaving, the father caught a glimpse of the ice cream mountain Tomoki had mentioned, and the sight of the children frantically licking it was terrifying. Soon after, the father discovered sticky residue all over the house, even at the front door. One day, when he came home again, he saw shoes outside, indicating that Tomoki's friends had come to play. 
But instead of playing, he saw a sticky Tomoki and his friends. All of his friends had melted. The father told his son to stop licking, but as he pushed Tomoki away, his head fell off. Meanwhile, the ice cream truck continued to roam the streets, searching for its next victims. The fourth story, titled The Story of the Mysterious Tunnel, begins with a mother taking her son, Goro, to the edge of a railway tunnel one day. She then slowly let go of his hand, walking into the tunnel alone and disappearing without a trace. Many years later, Goro's friends suggested they all explore the now-abandoned tunnel together. Reluctantly, Goro was dragged along by his friends. Despite having flashlights to illuminate their surroundings, the darkness inside the tunnel felt terrifying. As they ventured further, they noticed scratches on the walls, as if something had clawed its way through. Goro then spotted something lurking in the darkness. Frightened, his friends bolted, leaving him behind. Goro wanted to flee too, but he heard his younger sister calling out to him. It was indeed his sister, who claimed she had unknowingly wandered into the tunnel and didn't know how she got there. After returning home, the sister fell ill with a high fever. There were rumors that the tunnel lured people inside, but Goro's father had never told the sister about how her mother disappeared in the tunnel years ago. One evening after school, the sister went missing again. Worried she had returned to the tunnel, Goro's father set out with a flashlight to search for her. However, he didn't return even after it had become very late. Determined to find his father, Goro headed to the tunnel and discovered his father's lost flashlight. A drop of blood splattered on his face, which he mistook for water and ignored. Venturing deeper into the tunnel, Goro found a door leading to a cosmic ray observatory set up by a university. Behind the door, he found his sister, along with three researchers who claimed that they hadn't seen Goro's father. The observatory was located in the middle of the tunnel, so if his father had passed through, they should have seen him. A female researcher, Sayuri, drove Goro to the other side of the tunnel. On the ground, there were only tire tracks from her car earlier that day, with no sign of Goro's father having been there. It was as if he had vanished into thin air within the tunnel. Sayuri explained that various cosmic rays would fall from the universe and penetrate the human body like X-rays, as well as pass through mountains and enter the tunnel. That's why old tunnels were often used to observe these phenomena. However, after returning home, the sister was mysteriously drawn back to the tunnel once more. The professor and Sayuri discovered that they felt inexplicably exhausted and weak since their arrival at the tunnel. Photos they had taken recently revealed numerous invisible objects, piercing their bodies and flying around within the tunnel. Realizing the danger, they decided to temporarily close the observatory. Days later, the researchers and Goro's sister were again mysteriously drawn to the tunnel. When Goro rushed to the scene, he found the professor and another researcher being engulfed by the walls and the ground, bit by bit. The sister was also sucked into the wall. Goro tried to pull her out but only grasped at air, his hands covered in blood. Goro and Sayuri attempted to escape the tunnel, but they could feel something following them, the three people who had been swallowed by the tunnel earlier. A researcher tackled Sayuri, and she slowly sank into the ground. Then the sister lunged at Goro. Desperate, Goro tried to escape as several spirits pierced through him. In no time, he felt his strength draining away and his hands sinking into the ground slowly, indicating his tragic fate. The fifth story, titled The Hanging Balloons, begins with the girl Kazuko crouching beside the table, ignoring the knocking on her window and the calls to come out for dinner. She insisted she wouldn't be fooled this time. A month earlier, a popular actress, Miyuki, had tragically died, found hanging from electrical wires outside her apartment building. Her parents said that she had been troubled by her career in the entertainment industry. Kazuko, a close friend of Miyuki, was devastated by her death. At Miyuki's funeral, countless male fans cried inconsolably, unable to understand why she would take her own life. Some of the fans confronted Miyuki's boyfriend, suspecting that he had driven her to suicide. They threatened to attack him, but a girl threatened to call the police and drive them away. The girl comforted him, saying that it's not his fault and there must be another reason for Miyuki's death. Two weeks later, two young men claimed to have seen Miyuki's ghost in a park. Around midnight a week earlier, they had seen Miyuki's head floating above the trees. Many others had reported similar sightings of her floating head in the night sky. 
Psychologists believed that the grief of losing their idol had caused the fans to experience mass hallucinations. Others speculated that Miyuki's head had almost been severed by the rope, which was why they saw a ghostly apparition in the shape of a human head. Soon after, a witness photographed the floating head of Miyuki, which was terrifying. Kazuko, of course, didn't believe the stories, thinking that people were just spreading rumors. Miyuki's boyfriend, however, claimed that Miyuki's head would occasionally float into his front yard, staring at him with hollow eyes. Kazuko still didn't believe his nonsense, but one night the boy called her and asked her to confirm the sightings for herself. Sure enough, Kazuko saw Miyuki's giant head in the sky, drifting towards the forest. She followed it and discovered that the boy had climbed a tree to reach Miyuki's head. Suddenly a noose dropped from the sky and hoisted the boy up. When Kazuko looked up, she saw the boy's head attached to the rope. The two floating heads touched each other and began to kiss without using their tongues. Kazuko shared her experience with her classmates, suspecting that Miyuki had also been hanged this way, with the rope accidentally touching the electrical wires. It wasn't suicide, but something had claimed their lives. She believed that head balloons that couldn't find their bodies would wander aimlessly. At that moment, several girls saw four objects floating in the sky. As they came closer, they realized that they were their own faces, attached to ropes. The faces got closer and closer, and soon two heavy girls were lifted into the air by the ropes. Kazuko and another girl wearing glasses hid in a narrow alley as their head balloons pursued them. The head balloon of the girl with glasses relentlessly chased them, tossing the noose into the alley and scaring the girls. A boy living in the alley saw the scene and tried to save the girls by shooting the girl's balloon with a crossbow. The pierced balloon quickly deflated like a broken blow-up doll, turning into an ugly mess. Kazuko saw that the girl's face had also changed, becoming shriveled and lifeless. Terrified, Kazuko ran home. At this point, more and more head balloons began to appear in the sky. Finally, Kazuko managed to avoid her own balloon and ran back home to hide. A week later, the sky was filled with a dense mass of head balloons, dangling victims below them. Nobody knew where they came from. As they were talking, a reporter's head balloon swooped in and carried him away. The government urged people to stay indoors as much as possible, and if they had to leave, to drive in order to ensure their safety. They also warned against harming the balloons, or else the person would suffer the same fate. The situation escalated, but Kazuko's dad still insisted on going to the office for work. He thought that as long as he could avoid being caught while getting into the car, he would be fine. He set off in this manner, but the noose quickly caught his shoulder and hoisted him into the air. He soon stopped breathing. Kazuko's younger brother couldn't bear it anymore and decided to risk going out to get food for the family. He brought an umbrella, confident that it would protect him. As soon as he stepped outside, he threw the umbrella onto the noose hanging from a head balloon. It seemed like this trick worked and protected him from being taken away. A few days passed, and the brother still hadn't returned. Their mother, as if possessed, walked out the door and was also carried away. Now Kazuko was all alone. Voices outside the window kept trying to lure her out, but Kazuko knew it was a trap and refused to respond. Then she heard her brother's voice outside the window, saying he had brought back food. But when she opened the door, she saw his lifeless body. He had already been hanged like many others. Now it was Kazuko's turn for her head balloon to succeed in capturing her after she opened the door. The sixth story, titled The Room with Four Walls, begins with Koichi, who had an upcoming exam, was unable to study due to the noise his younger brother, Soichi, made in the attic. Unable to bear it any longer, he ran to complain to their dad, only to find Soichi sitting quietly in front of the TV. Koichi knew this was just an act, and tried to return to his room to continue studying, but Soichi's mischievous sounds started up again as soon as he closed the door. When Koichi opened the door to confront him, Soichi ran off. Koichi tackled his brother to the ground, but Soichi claimed he was just rushing to the bathroom, and then he actually wet his pants. To divert attention, Soichi claimed that a mischievous ghost was causing the chaos, and that it had nothing to do with him. But Koichi knew Soichi was the troublemaker. Suddenly, objects in the room started flying around. Could it really be a mischievous ghost? Upon closer inspection, Koichi saw that the objects were attached to strings, with Soichi hiding in the closet, orchestrating the chaos. Koichi threatened to move out if the chaos continued, so their dad came up with an idea to have a skilled carpenter he knew install soundproofing in the room. The carpenter arrived quickly, but his appearance was quite terrifying. He said he would use a technique called four-layer walls to create a perfectly soundproofed room. Only with four layers could the room be as quiet as dead silence. 
The carpenter praised Soichi's skill with a hammer and asked him to help with the soundproofing. After a day of work, he received the carpenter's praise. When Koichi returned home from school in the evening, he found that the windows had also been sealed, taking the soundproofing work to the extreme. He hesitantly opened the door to find another door behind it, and then another, and another. Each door was smaller than the last. After opening all four doors, he entered a tiny room that could only fit a desk. The room had become smaller due to the four layers of walls, but the soundproofing was excellent. As long as he could study in peace, nothing else mattered. However, after a short while, he heard strange noises again. It was Soichi imitating the sound of cicadas. The space between the doors was just enough for a person to crawl into, and Soichi must have crawled in there. Frustrated, Koichi started searching for his annoying brother. After climbing up and down and crawling back and forth, he finally caught Soichi red-handed. Soichi tried to escape, but because he had helped with the construction, he knew the layout well. Koichi was left in a mess, eventually being lured into the sewer. Soichi's pranks continued, but due to his overexertion, there wasn't enough oxygen left in the room, causing him to fall down unconscious. The seventh story, titled Where the Sandman Lives, begins with an exhausted man named Yuji, having not slept for three days straight. He told Mari that in his dreams there lived another version of himself who wanted to enter the real world. Whenever Yuji fell asleep, the other self would wake up and act like a sleep demon, trying to drag Yuji into the dream to replace him in reality. The sleep demon began its actions three days ago, waking Yuji whenever he fell asleep. Although Mari didn't believe it, she agreed to help watch over Yuji to ensure he wouldn't fall asleep. Mari came to Yuji's house, and by then he was on the verge of collapse. He asked Mari to tie his hands and feet with tape to prevent the sleep demon from escaping. Mari did as he said, and soon, Yuji fell into a deep sleep. After he was asleep and snoring like a pig, Mari cut the tape from Yuji's hands and feet because she knew it was all Yuji's imagination and there was no sleep demon at all. Then she gradually fell asleep herself. Around 11 p.m., Mari was astonished to see Yuji's arm flipping out and a hand extending from his mouth, grabbing her greasy leg. Mari woke Yuji up, and with all his strength, Yuji pushed the sleep demon's hand back into his mouth and pulled his arm back out, flipping it back into place. Yuji explained that his dream self wanted to turn him inside out. He used to dream inside his body, but now that the sleep demon has discovered the outside world, he wants to come out. Since losing his family, Yuji felt empty inside. As a child, he imagined flying like a bird, but since it was impossible in reality, he tried it in his dreams. Even so, he would mock himself in his dreams, saying he could never fly. To him, the dream world felt more real than reality. The dream self wanted to come out because he wanted Mari. Yuji fell asleep again, and Mari tied their hands together with tape to pull him out of the dream world. However, she didn't expect the sleep demon's power to be so strong. Her hand was dragged into Yuji's body, and soon Yuji's arms were completely flipped. Mari was slowly devoured by the sleep demon, saying to Yuji that it's okay, she would go with him. Not long after, the police arrived due to Mari's disappearance. Her bag was still at Yuji's house. Yuji, now possibly the sleep demon itself, told the police they wouldn't find her in the real world because she had become part of his insides and had gone to his dream world. The eighth story, titled Intruder, begins with a boy named Oshikiri, who was a quiet, solitary student in the eyes of others. One day, the student Kamiyama was chatting with his two classmates in the library, saying he could sense the existence of parallel universe humans lately and wanted to find related books to learn more. He found the book he wanted in Oshikiri's hands, realizing that Oshikiri was also interested in such things. Several people with the same interests went to the city to discuss parallel universes. Oshikiri told everyone that he often heard strange footsteps in his house. The other three were both excited and thrilled as they arrived at Oshikiri's castle-like home. They entered Oshikiri's house through the back door, and although Oshikiri lived alone, the other three felt the presence of something else. After Oshikiri gave them a tour of his mansion, Kamiyama deduced that the strange footsteps must have been made by an intruder from another dimension. After chatting happily for a while, the group decided it was time to leave. Suddenly, the sound of a clock startled them, and they heard the footsteps that Oshikiri had mentioned. They were sure it was the sound of the intruder from another dimension. The group followed the sound downstairs and heard the intruder run outside. Looking through the window, they saw another Oshikiri, who looked exactly like their friend, digging a hole to bury someone. He must have killed someone in his world and came to this one to hide the body and escape punishment. Unable to contain himself, Oshikiri opened the window and shouted at his doppelganger to stop. 
The other Oshikiri just pointed at him and laughed maniacally before gradually disappearing. It seemed that he had gained the ability to enter and exit this world at will. To their horror, they discovered that the person the other Oshikiri intended to bury was their classmate Kamiyama. They also found two more bodies nearby, which turned out to be their other friends. Knowing that their classmate Oshikiri wasn't responsible for this, they decided to bury the three bodies to avoid any unnecessary trouble. They couldn't help but wonder what terrifying things the Oshikiri from another dimension would do next, and what if the Oshikiri of their current world also had the potential to become a killer? The ninth story, titled The Long Hair in the Attic, begins with Chiemi and her boyfriend having been dating for almost ten years. Chiemi cared deeply for her boyfriend and always dressed as he wished to make him happy. However, this was becoming a burden to her. Boyfriend eventually grew tired of Chiemi and heartlessly broke up with her. Chiemi returned home, feeling down, and ignored her younger sister's questions. Hearing noises in the attic, Chiemi grabbed a wooden sword and jabbed at the ceiling, quieting the noise. Claiming she was tired, she sent her sister away. A photo of her and her boyfriend took Chiemi back to the day they stood by the beautiful sea. Boyfriend had said she would look prettier with long hair, so she had grown it out for him. Now, she was abandoned. Chiemi cried on her bed. The next morning, she found that her long hair had caught a rat. Disgusted, she washed her hair repeatedly. Deciding to cut her hair, she asked her sister to fetch scissors. As the sister went downstairs, she heard Chiemi scream. Rushing back upstairs, she saw Chiemi lying in a pool of blood, her head missing. That night, boyfriend, who had been unfaithful to Chiemi, received a mysterious phone call. All he could hear was a gnashing sound, like Chiemi grinding her teeth, even though she was dead. The noises in the attic ceased, and their father decided to clean up the rat carcasses. The sister waited downstairs, but couldn't reach him. Climbing up, she saw him staring in terror at something. Her father had been scared to death. The flashlight on the floor illuminated Chiemi's missing head. The sister tried to untangle Chiemi's hair, but only hurt her hands. Suddenly, the hair moved on its own, contorting Chiemi's face into a terrifying expression. The hair slithered out of the house like a worm and then tied up boyfriend and hung him from the ceiling, tearing him apart limb by limb as the sound of grinding teeth filled the air. The tenth story, titled Mold, begins with Akasaka returning to Japan after being away for a whole year. Before leaving, he had rented his newly renovated house to the family of his high school teacher. By now, the teacher's family should have moved out. However, upon entering the house, he saw that the place was in disarray, with garbage everywhere and moldy food in the refrigerator. The bathtub was also filled with disgusting sludge. His younger brother, Seiji, seemed to know something, and Akasaka suspected that the teacher had taken revenge on him for not wanting to rent the house to them in the first place. Seiji hesitated to speak, so Akasaka had no choice but to clean up the entire house himself. A year earlier, Seiji called to say that the teacher's house had burned down and they needed a place to stay during the rebuilding process. Coincidentally, Akasaka was being transferred abroad for work, so the teacher asked Seiji to connect his brother in hopes of renting his house. Although Akasaka had always disliked the teacher, he couldn't refuse since the teacher was now Seiji's homeroom teacher. The teacher's family, including their daughter, all had a rather sleazy appearance. During their conversation, the teacher kept flattering Akasaka and begged him to rent the house to them to help them in their time of need. With Seiji vouching for them, Akasaka reluctantly agreed. Back to the present, Akasaka woke up in the middle of the night to find the entire house looking like it had been infected with psoriasis. Every room was in a disgusting state. He asked his brother about the whereabouts of the teacher's family, but Seiji claimed he didn't know. He had tried to find the teacher, but their original house was still in the burned-down state. Meanwhile, Akasaka's house continued to deteriorate, with mold growing everywhere and the dampness becoming unbearable. The bathroom was even unusable. Seiji urged his brother to move out as soon as possible. He asked Seiji repeatedly for the reason, and Seiji finally revealed the truth. When he had visited the house earlier, the teacher's baby and wife had been in a similar condition, likely infected by a particular type of mold. Seiji quickly left the place as if escaping. At this point, Akasaka's house had become overrun with vine-like growths that squirted water when squeezed. He soon found the teacher's family on the second floor, all of them dead with blood pouring from their orifices, transformed by the same mold. It didn't take long for Akasaka to become infected and suffer the same fate. 
The eleventh story, titled Library Vision, begins with a couple, Goro and Coco, living in a picturesque villa. Goro's house was like a library filled with books, including romance novels. Coco took a book called René of the Winter Wind to read, which made Goro furious. He insisted that she ask for his permission before reading any books in the future. Even if he lost just one book for a short while, he couldn't bear it. Goro had been keeping a diary since he was four years old without interruption. His book collection represented his past, while his diary chronicled his present. Goro had a nightmare, in which one book after another disappeared. He checked the shelves and found that René of the Winter Wind was missing again. It was his late mother's most cherished book. He continued checking and discovered that Hell of Thorns, his father's most treasured book, was also gone. Unable to sleep, Goro spent all day checking his books and reading his diary. Coco noticed that when Goro was very young, his mother had left him for another man. Unable to accept the truth, his father became twisted and recited Hell of Thorns to Goro every night, whose horror stories negatively affected Goro's personality. One day, Goro screamed that his books had all run away, nearly losing his sanity. In a daze, he seemed to see a hollow-eyed woman visiting his home. Because she could recite the entire content of the book, Goro believed she was Rene from Rene of the Winter Wind. He even claimed that she was now standing beside Coco. A few days later, Goro shuddered and said that Hell of Thorns had returned. He then recited the cursed novel in an unsettling voice. Coco knew that Goro must be sick. A couple of days later, Goro began mechanically reciting Hell of Thorns, and his body seemed to have several scratch marks. A strange smile appeared on his face as he muttered about defeating Hell of Thorns and its disappearance. After another couple of days, René of the Winter Wind also vanished. Goro could unconsciously memorize the entire book, so she disappeared as well. The pain and bitterness of gaining and losing the books drove Goro to decide to store all his books into his mind. He began reciting all the books in his house day and night without eating or drinking as if possessed. His brain capacity was nearing its limit. In a daze, Goro seemed to hear René's gentle voice again. He accidentally knocked over an oil lamp, and a roaring fire devoured all his books. Although Goro miraculously survived, he was left in a terrible state, still reciting his books. It turned out that Coco was also a character from a book and never really existed. Goro seemed to see his mother once more, showing that he was trapped inside these books and influenced by their visions. The twelfth story, titled Layers of Fear, begins at the archaeological site, where a group of archaeologists discovered something strange. They wondered if it was a geological fold or a man-made structure. They called in a professor to take a look. The site appeared to be a burial ground, with a child's skull uncovered after some digging. The professor speculated that this was the result of a ritual, with the body carefully covered in layers of clay, eventually forming a massive human-shaped tomb that was buried underground. Just then, a thunder struck unexpectedly at the site. The mystery of the tomb would remain unsolved until a detailed geological analysis could be conducted. As it started to rain, the professor quietly excavated the skull and took it with him. Twenty-one years later, together with her family, Raimi was returning from a memorial service for her father, the professor. The beautiful Raimi had been a successful actress in her youth, but had given up her career willingly. She claimed that she only became a star to gain her mother's attention and affection. Upon hearing this, her mother was moved, wishing she could go back in time and shower little Raimi with love. This revelation made Narumi, Raimi's older sister, jealous. She accused her mother of favoritism, especially when it came to spending money on Raimi's upbringing. The mother retorted that it was because Narumi wasn't as attractive as her sister. This comment distracted Narumi, causing her to swerve to avoid an oncoming truck, crashing the car into a tree on the side of the road. When Raimi woke up in the hospital, she was surprised to discover that her face had been cut in half by a road sign during the accident. Miraculously, she regained consciousness, her life not in jeopardy. A new layer of skin had grown beneath the damaged one. Even more incredible was the revelation that Raimi's body was made up of layers, lacking the organs, brain, and bones found in a normal human body. She was entirely composed of layers of epithelial tissue like an onion. The doctors theorized that the center of her body was her embryonic form, with each layer extending outward, representing her at different ages. Due to the accident, she had lost her 20-year-old layer, revealing her 19-year-old self beneath. This led to the terrifying possibility that younger versions of Raimi were still hidden within her body. Narumi believed this was a curse. 
It turns out, 21 years earlier, the professor's health condition got worse after excavating the cursed tomb and died nine years later, possibly due to the curse. But the curse had not stopped with his death. It seemed like the curse had been transferred to his offspring, including Raimi, who had multi-layered body tissues, and Narumi, who had multi-layered teeth. The photos taken of the soil layers surrounding the excavated skull matched Raimi's MRI scans. Because of this, Narumi proposed holding a memorial service at the archaeological site to remove the curse, but their mother opposed the idea, dismissing it as nonsense. She wanted to find a renowned doctor to treat Raimi instead. Raimi argued with her mother, claiming she was no longer a child and had enough of her mother's overbearing attitude. She blamed the car accident on her mother's meddling. Late at night, their mother sat by Raimi's bedside, calling out to her two-year-old self. Unexpectedly, she received a response from within Raimi's body. The voice of the two-year-old girl begged to be let out, and the mother, now driven by a twisted desire, tore off half of Raimi's face. Narumi walked in on this horrifying scene, with Raimi having passed out from the pain. Their mother continued her gruesome task, determined to peel away the layers and reveal her two-year-old daughter. With Narumi's help, they began tearing at Raimi's body. But instead of uncovering her younger self, they only found layer after layer of increasingly emaciated flesh. Driven mad, their mother started to peel away her own face, hoping to reveal her 38-year-old self so she could give birth to another Raimi. However, she only exposed a horrific layer of muscle and tissue, leaving her face disfigured. Raimi was now a shriveled two-year-old version of herself. The true curse wasn't the layers of their bodies, but the twisted nature of humanity and the darkness within their hearts. The 13th story, titled The Thing That Drifted Ashore, begins with a giant fish-like creature drifting up on the shore, covered in strange bumps. The creature had already begun to rot, emitting a nauseating smell. Seven years ago, a ferry sank at sea, and Mie's fiancé was on board. Although she knew that he was no longer alive, Mie couldn't help but come and take a look. To everyone's surprise, under the creature's transparent skin, there were human corpses. Researchers cut open the creature's abdomen, and a torrent of people poured out. Shockingly, they moved and were alive. Mie recognized one of them, her fiancé who had perished seven years ago. It seemed that these people were passengers who had died at sea and had been swallowed by the giant fish. They had lived like parasites in its intestines for seven years. However, they could no longer understand Mie's words and moved mechanically as they crawled up. It seemed like these humans could survive by absorbing nutrients from the creature's intestines, and it was possible for them to enter other organisms and become parasites. The 14th story, titled Tomi A e Photo, begins with a girl of the photography club named Tsukiko, often taking pictures of handsome boys and selling them at high prices to girls who secretly admired them. When the handsome Yamazaki passed by, she naturally didn't miss the opportunity to take his picture, claiming that it was a free service. It was then that she noticed Tomi A, e, the newly transferred student, being a discipline committee member, had seen everything. The next day, as she sold a photo at a high price to a girl, Tommy A appeared with her two followers, confiscating the photo and saying that they had spared her by not reporting her to the teacher. Enraged but helpless, Tsukiko had no choice but to accept this loss. The following day, Yamazaki approached her, asking her to take photos of Tommy A. Unable to refuse the handsome boy's request, Tsukiko hid and secretly took several beautiful shots of Tommy A. However, Tommy A caught her in the act. Instead of being angry, Tomie struck poses for the camera, instructing her to distribute the photos around the school, possibly because she was confident in her sexy appearance. But while Tsukiko was taking the photos, a teacher suddenly appeared and caught them red-handed. The teacher scolded Tsukiko for joining the photography club just to take pictures and make money. So the defiant Tsukiko claimed that she would quit the club. After returning home, she developed Tomie's photos and was shocked to see that each image showed a terrifying twisted face splitting from her original face. She was terrified, but decided to take revenge on Tomie by scattering these photos all over the school. Upon seeing the photos, Tomie's expression changed dramatically. Yamazaki warned Tsukiko to hide since Tomie was trembling with rage and wanted to kill her with the help of her followers. Tsukiko hid in a dark room, and Yamazaki tricked Tomie's followers away. Then, he suddenly attacked her from behind. He was also trying to kill her for Tomie's sake. In the struggle, Tsukiko splashed a bottle of anti-hormone spray on Yamazaki's face and escaped back to her house. 
To her surprise, Tomie visited her soon after, claiming that she didn't know anyone named Yamazaki and had never ordered him to kill her. Tomie had come to apologize, explaining that the teacher's sudden appearance during the photo shoot was a coincidence, not her doing. Tomie noticed some Gaudi-designed architecture photos on the wall, stating she was born in France and lived in a Gaudi-designed house in Barcelona, Spain, before moving. She had even met Picasso there. After that, Tomie invited Tsukiko to her house, but Tsukiko insulted Tomie, calling her a lying monster, and that the photos showed her true face. The insulted Tomie showed a terrifying expression and clutched her head in pain. An eye appeared on her forehead. Hearing the commotion, Tomie's followers entered, and by then, she had grown another grotesque face. Tsukiko then ordered them to cut off and burn her monstrous face. The obedient followers did as told, but accidentally decapitated Tomie entirely. The ugly face screamed in a chicken voice, ordering them to burn the other face as well. Tsukiko fainted at the sight. The followers carried Tomie's head away, but the headless body stood up, and a disgusting new head grew from the neck. The creature screamed, opened the door, and ran outside. It left the girl's house, and Tsukiko believed the entire event was just a dream. She decided to clean up the scene. The 15th story, titled Unendurable Labyrinth, begins with a girl, Sayako, having not attended the class for a while because her classmates often gossiped about her behind her back. Her friend was worried about her. To cheer her up, they decided to go on a trip to the mountains together. However, they ended up getting lost, and the surroundings became increasingly strange. The numerous Buddha statues were eerie and unnerving. As they wandered, they came across a group of ascetic monks. The friend wanted to ask them for directions, but the monks stared at them with terrified eyes, frightening her into silence. Soon after, the girls saw the monks standing under a waterfall, practicing their rituals, some even hanging upside down. A kind and gentle-looking monk appeared, explaining that this was an isolated, sacred place. He warned them that it was dangerous to leave hastily, and invited them to stay in the temple for the night. The monk claimed to have over a million followers. Sayako decided to stay and practice meditation for spiritual growth, and her friend reluctantly agreed to stay with her. Later they met a boy, Kuramoto, who pretended to practice here while secretly investigating his brother's whereabouts. He said that his brother had joined this religious group five years ago and then vanished. The next day, the monk invited Sayako to join the religious group, but she hesitated after hearing Kuramoto's story. At that moment, a meditation ceremony was taking place, which occurred once every three years. The ritual involved burying living monks in wooden coffins to remove their body fat and make their bodies more suitable for mummification. Kuramoto said that no ordinary person could participate in such an event. As the monks left, the three girls followed them discreetly. However, they soon lost sight of the group. It seemed impossible for so many people to disappear so suddenly. They discovered a hidden door behind a large Buddha statue, which led to a secret passage. Gathering their courage, they ventured down the passage and found two rows of terrifying mummies. Kuramoto searched through the mummies and found some younger mummies. Just then, she found her brother among them, who had been mummified. Knowing that they might have been killed by the monks for their ritual, Sayako and her friend were horrified and wanted to leave this creepy place, but they couldn't find their way out. The underground maze grew colder, and Sayako collapsed to the ground, saying that the mummy's eyes were terrifying. Both girls looked at the mummies and saw that they were indeed staring at them. The 16th story, titled The Bully, begins with Kuriko, who was an introverted girl. One day, a mother who had just moved to the neighborhood entrusted her son to Kuriko's care and gave her a piece of chocolate as a token of gratitude. Naoya became very attached to Kuriko and always wanted her to play with him. The two had a great time together, and that evening, Naoya's mother even brought a cake as a thank you, showing their thoughtfulness. However, Kuriko gradually discovered that it was more fun to tease and bully the innocent Naoya than to play with him. Naoya never fought back and would continue to pester Kuriko to play with him as if nothing had happened. This time, Kuriko pushed Naoya's head into a gutter, making him cry out in distress and even punished him with a stick and forced him to jump from a high place. Fortunately, Naoya's mother appeared just in time to intervene. Years passed and Kuriko grew into a young woman. One day, Naoya, who she hadn't seen in a long time, reappeared in her life, confessing that he had been in love with her all these years and couldn't forget her. Touched by the fact that Naoya wasn't angry about their childhood, Kuriko agreed, and the two quickly got married and had a child. However, after they had a child, Naoya left her, leaving behind a son who looked almost identical to Naoya. 
Kuriko couldn't help but see her son as Naoya and began to bully him just as she had done to Naoya years ago. She finally understood that this was Naoya's revenge on her. So Kuriko disguised herself as she had been in the past and took her son to the same park where the bullying had taken place, intending to replicate her past misdeeds. The 17th story, titled The Back Alley, begins with a boy, Ishida, deciding to lodge at a local family's home to be closer to school. The homeowner was a warm-hearted person. While out for a walk, Ishida noticed a tall wall next to the house, with a narrow alley behind it, surrounded by barbed wire. At dinner, he met the homeowner's 14-year-old daughter, Shinobu, who seemed introverted. Late at night, Ishida heard the sound of children playing loudly in the alley. He shouted for them to be quiet, but to no avail, so he climbed out of the window and jumped onto the wall of the alley, only to see nothing. The next day, he told Shinobu about the incident. She explained that there were many alleys nearby, and sounds from far away could seem close. She advised him not to overthink it and warned him not to do anything dangerous. That night, Ishida heard sounds coming from the alley again, as if someone was calling Shinobu's name. The following day, after leaving the house, he was stopped by a man who claimed to have lodged in the same room ten years ago. The man said there had been a murder in the alley, which led to a sewer grate. He even found the bodies of three children inside, and the wall still had stains in the shape of the children. He could see the stains every night from his window, as if the children were playing in the alley. Ishida thought the man was lying since his room didn't have any windows. However, upon returning, he noticed a bookshelf and discovered a hidden window behind it, along with a rope. When he looked down, he saw the dark stains and the sewer grate. Climbing down using the rope, he found the wall covered in children's writing. Upon breaking the lock on the grate, he found several bodies. Terrified, he tried to climb back up but was stabbed by Shinobu with a knife, causing him to fall down. It's revealed that when Shinobu was little, three neighborhood bullies often tormented her and occupied the alley, so she managed to lock them in the sewer. Later, her father discovered the bodies and realized what his daughter had done. Hastily, he built the wall to seal the alley. Since then, the vengeful spirits of the bullies would come out at night and make a ruckus, scaring away lodgers. Afterward, Shinobu killed two more classmates she disliked, as well as her nagging father. These restless spirits would emerge from the wall at night, cursing Shinobu and plotting to pull her down from the wall. But she wouldn't go down at night, finding their anger amusing. When Ishida fell and was knocked unconscious, Shinobu went to check on him, but the rope snapped the moment she climbed down. With no one at home and darkness falling, the spirits gradually materialized, indicating that Shinobu might not escape their wrath this time. The 18th story, titled Whispering Woman, begins with Mitsu going to a large mansion for a job interview to be a caretaker. The employer said that no one they had hired so far could tolerate his daughter Yumi, and none could last more than a week. It turned out Yumi was a hysterical girl and unable to make decisions on her own, even for simple matters like standing or sitting. If she couldn't get an answer from others, she would go crazy. Mitsu then calmly whispered instructions in her ear, quickly calming Yumi down. Her father was satisfied with Mitsu's performance, but wondered how long she could last. It was evident that Mitsu's first day was challenging, but she persisted. After that, Mitsu endured an entire month taking meticulous care of Yumi, who now could do many things she couldn't before, as long as Mitsu stayed close. The father marveled at Mitsu's skills, but couldn't understand why she could tolerate his hysterical daughter for so long. So, he asked his secretary to investigate Mitsu's background. As the days went by, Mitsu looked increasingly haggard. When asked about the injury on her face, she excused herself and left. In the days that followed, Mitsu dragged her exhausted body to work, accomplishing more than any regular person could. She also brought luck to Yumi. Every decision Mitsu made had a positive impact on Yumi's life. A few days ago, a truck lost control and crashed into the sidewalk where Yumi usually took her walks. That day, they both managed to avoid the accident. Now, with just a simple whisper from Mitsu, Yumi could follow her instructions perfectly. However, Mitsu had turned into a ghost-like figure. At this point, her background was investigated. She had been supporting an unemployed boyfriend, letting him live in her apartment like a parasite. But he had forced her to work as a caretaker because it's a high-paying job. Mitsu was soon injured by her boyfriend and tragically died. The doctor said that even without the injury, her health wouldn't have lasted much longer. Her boyfriend was now wanted by the police nationwide. But Yumi didn't need to worry, as Mitsu, although dead, remained by her side like a ghost, guiding her every move. Yumi could still hear Mitsu's faint voice. Under her guidance, Yumi practiced with a knife in the mud and later, following her instructions, took revenge on the abusive boyfriend.
Before dying, Mitsu had told Yumi she would always be with her. The 19th story, titled Soichi's Beloved Pet, begins with Soichi's sister finding a cute kitten on the roadside and bringing it home, persuading their parents to let them keep it. The siblings were overjoyed. However, the poor kitten had the misfortune of meeting Soichi. He began thinking of ways to bully the kitten. When his sister found out, she slapped him hard, causing Soichi to fall on the cat and get scratched by it. The sister and her older brother Koichi found it satisfying, thinking Soichi deserved it for mistreating the animal. Koichi believed they needed to correct Soichi's twisted personality as soon as possible, or he would undoubtedly become a criminal when he grew up. Little did they know, Soichi had also cursed the kitten, causing it to change. It became interested in Soichi's dead snake and even began chewing on it. When they tried to stop it from eating, the kitten showed a terrifying expression. Then, the kitten ran to the sewer and caught a centipede longer than itself, playing with it before eating it. The chaos continued as the kitten wreaked havoc at home, scratching up all the doors. Later, it brought back a never-before-seen terrifying creature and started gnawing on it, seemingly happy with Soichi's praise. Koichi and the sister, worried about the kitten, tightened the doors and windows but soon discovered cat hairs floating in the air, making it hard to breathe. When they checked on Soichi, they found him wearing a mask, holding the shedding kitten with cat hair everywhere. The sister tried to hold the kitten, but it puffed up at her. Upset, she left the room in tears. When Koichi tried to hold it, the kitten released a massive electric shock, frying Soichi inside and out. Koichi quickly took his family and fled the house, leaving Soichi to endure the torment of electrotherapy. After this incident, the kitten returned to normal, but Soichi was left in a miserable state, a victim of his own actions. The 20th story, titled Headless Statue, begins with an art teacher working on his personal exhibition in the art room. His artwork was the legendary headless sculpture. He believed that faces were unnecessary for art pieces, and by removing the face, many creative images could be produced. One evening, a student named Shimada volunteered to stay and help the teacher finish his work. However, that night, the teacher was murdered. His head was severed, leaving only his body in the art room. Shimada didn't come to school either. Worried about Shimada, Rumi went to his house to look for him. Shimada appeared with a mask on, acting strange. As soon as they met, he confessed his love to Rumi, saying he visited the art room just to see her. Meanwhile, two girls went to the art room to find some materials, nervously discussing the teacher's murder. Suddenly, they heard knocking from a room and saw the teacher's face appear as the door slowly opened. Back with Shimada, he told Rumi that the teacher was still alive and took her back to the art room, asking her to wait there. Rumi smelled a foul odor as Shimada quietly locked the door behind them. He then removed his mask and the black cloth covering a sculpture, revealing the teacher's head underneath. Shimada praised Rumi's beauty as he held the severed head, but Rumi slapped him, knocking off his own head, revealing another headless sculpture. It turns out Shimada had been dead for a while. The sculpture lunged at Rumi, trying to take her head. She used a chair to smash its legs, discovering it was made of plaster. Another sculpture appeared with a knife, and Rumi frantically escaped through the door. As soon as she left, she encountered yet another sculpture. Rumi fled upstairs for her shitty life and found the headless bodies of the two girls. A group of sculptures fought over the girls' heads. Seeing Rumi, they all lunged at her, intending to claim her good-looking head rather than her sexy body. This is Daniel CC Movie Channel. Stay safe and enjoy your day.